Okay, so let's talk about Hurwitz's term, which is really uh, about how does the number of zeros of a holomorphic function, um, how does this behave under limits, um, you know, uh, taking sequences of holomorphic functions. So, let's suppose that we have a sequence of holomorphic functions and the correct convergence is um, uniformly on compact subsets, right? And we know that uh, if we have uniform convergence on compact subsets, then uh, we have uh, a holomorphic limit, right? So now suppose that we have a gamma in inside this U, and again, as, as usual, it's um, homologous to zero in U, meaning it doesn't go around anything in the complement of U. And let's suppose that, that gamma only goes around at most once around um, any point uh, in U, and, and uh, it only goes around in the positive direction, possibly. It goes around some, uh, not around all of course. And let V be the set that uh, gamma goes around. Right? So all those points whose, well, you know, where the winding number of, of gamma around those points is equal to 1. Uh, and let's suppose that F has no zeros on gamma as, 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 as a set on this cycle. Um, and inside, in V, uh, it has k zeros up to multiplicity. Then, for a large enough n, uh, f sub n uh, has uh, uh, k zeros uh, up to multiplicity in V as well, right? So basically, the number of zeros of of f n has to stab stabilize, and it will be exactly k. All right, so let's let's look at the proof. So, gamma, uh, cycle is compact. So therefore, and and uh, uh, and and f has no zeros on on gamma, right? So therefore, uh, th there is a you know positive lower bound. There is some delta, which is strictly less than all the uh, all the values of f on gamma, but it's still positive. Right now, the sequence f n is converges uniformly to f on gamma because it's compact. Right, so therefore we can uh, we can choose an n large enough. So choose a capital n so you for all n bigger than capital n. Uh, the f minus f sub n is going to be less than delta. Uh, for all uh, uh, z in gamma. But we know already that uh, delta is a lower bound for, uh, for the modules of f on gamma. So we have this inequality, so if you forget about the delta in the middle, uh, that's precisely the inequality that we get in Rouché. And Rouché now says that f and f n, f sub n, have the same number of zeros in V, right? It was exactly this this sort of V in Rouchet's theorem. Okay, so that's a proof. That's that's uh, uh, you know essentially. Uh, I guess uh, you know the, the main point is it's already uh, Rouchet is already telling you what happens uh, uh, to to zeros uh, for you know if you have a function that's that's close enough, right? So Horowitz is just another version of that. It's, it's writing it in terms of a sequence um, instead of um, uh, instead of uh, uh, just two functions being close. Right? Now, the no zeros on gamma, that's, that's necessary because, uh, well, uh, it's a simple counterexample. If, if uh, f is z minus 1, uh, then this this has a zero on the unit disk, uh, on the unit circle, sorry, um, right? Uh, so, 
and then uh, if, if I have f sub n be uh, basically the same thing, z plus, but now 1 minus n, well this has a 0 in the unit disk inside. So if we, if we take gamma to be the boundary of uh, uh, the unit disk and the, 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 the circle, then uh, we have uh, uh, a 0 in the circle, but f has no zeros in D, right? But F sub n has always one zero, right? And F sub n goes uniformly actually to, to F, right? So, so the, uh, the, uh, the requirement that there's no zeros on gamma is necessary for sort of a trivial reason, right? I mean, you, you might have zeros that are either inside or, or, or outside going towards, going towards gamma, so. All right, let's let's look at uh, a, a, a simple example uh, or something that, that 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 we can say immediately. So, for example, for every for every radius, every positive radius, there is an n such that for all d uh, uh, this polynomial uh, p sub d uh, this has no zeros on the the, the disk of radius R. So for every R, there is a capital N, right? Such that this is true. Why is that true? Well, P sub D are the partial sums of the power series of E to the Z. E to the Z has no zeros anywhere. Uh, so uh, looking at uh, 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 looking at you know given given a a a, 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 a disk of radius R. Uh, we just apply Hurwitz, right? Because the, the power series uh, for e to the z converges uniformly on compact sets uh, in the plane, right? In the entire plane. So, I mean, normally you would say, well, I mean, this is a polynomial. It has it, it has n uh, sorry d zeros uh, in the in the complex plane, but it says that that uh, uh, you know. Given any disk, we can find a large enough D such that all those D zeros they will be somewhere outside this disk. All right. Now the usual application of Hurwitz, and a lot of times this is the statement of Hurwitz, is for a small disk. Um, but it's uh, it's exactly the way that that we've actually you know the, the way that we stated it includes this uh, this following statement. Um, if you if you let gamma instead of being uh, an arbitrary cycle, uh, if you let it to be the boundary of a small disk, <coughs> sorry, uh, 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 around um, a point where where uh, f has a zero. So suppose that at uh, f sub n, our homomorphic functions converging uniformly on compact subsets to some f, and let's suppose that uh, uh, z naught is a zero of f of order k. Then, for a small enough disk, um, you just have to pick a point of disk such that uh, it has no other, you know, f has no other zeros on the closed disk. Uh, so for a small enough disk. Uh, 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 you, you know, uh, of radius r around z naught, there exists an n uh, such that uh, uh, for all n bigger than, than than capital n, f sub n has k zeros up to multiplicity in that disk, right? So for large enough uh, n, f sub n has uh, has k zeros up to multiplicity in this disk. Right, so that's the usual, uh, that's the usual application of of Hurwitz, and there's the usual statement of Hurwitz, or maybe not the usual statement, but one of the one of the common statements of of Hurwitz. Um, so we we stated it slightly more generally. Uh, now Hurwitz uh, uh, does not uh, does not really work for real functions. Uh, um, so, so here's an example. Uh, so. Suppose that uh, I take just just real functions. So, so x is going to be a real number. So this is, uh, f is now at this point uh, a function from the real line to the real line, and it's x squared, right? That has um, a zero at um, at zero, and f sub n let it be uh, x squared plus uh, one over n. 
Now f sub n goes uniformly to f, uh, but f sub n is never zero, right? Despite f having uh, a, a, a zero of, of, of order two uh, at the origin, right? On the other hand, if we uh, let uh, uh, we basically take the same thing, but now we start plugging in complex numbers. So we get a, uh, a function of a complex variable, and now it's complex valued as well. Um, and we take the same f sub n, or well, at least the same formula, but we again start plugging in complex numbers. So z squared plus uh, one over n, right? I mean, these are the same functions if we restrict to the real line. But uh, we get that f, uh, f sub n converges to f uniformly still uniformly on the on the entire complex plane actually um, and uh, now for any small disk um, uh, you know epsilon disk around zero uh, the for a large enough n uh, the the f sub n is going to have two zeros right then in this case you can actually just find them you can just factor um, and uh, you notice that they're uh, that the that the two zeros are purely imaginary, right? They're, they're not on the real line, right? So, which uh, which which we noticed over here was the was the x squared, right? Uh, uh, you know, the two zeros of the x squared plus one over n. Uh, those guys were, you know, well, it didn't have uh, any zeros, even though x squared had a zero of order two. All right, uh, maybe out of historical, you know, traditional reasons, uh, injective holomorphic maps are called univalent. So let's uh, let's maybe use that uh, notation uh, it, or the terminology. It's uh, I haven't seen it used in any other context, and uh, it sort of doesn't make sense. Uh, but anyway, that's 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 what people call them. Uh, but they're really just injective holomorphic uh, functions. So. As an application of, of Hurwitz theorem to uh, sequences of univalent uh, functions, so suppose that uh, uh, that uh, we have um, uh, a domain and connected is, is important here, and uh, a sequence of univalent homomorphic functions that converges uniformly on compact sets to uh, to uh, some f. Then f is either univalent or constant. So it could be constant, but if it's not constant, it's univalent. So for example, if I have a sequence of automorphisms of, of a domain, then the limit is either an automorphism or it's constant. But it cannot, cannot be, let's say, two to one. Um, all right, so suppose f is not a constant. Uh, then it's not a constant uh, locally, near every point, right? Um, and this is where we use that u as a domain. Not constant somewhere, it's not constant everywhere, right? Because the uh, the derivative can, you know, uh, 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 if it's constant somewhere, then the derivative would be identically zero near there, right? So, all right. And uh, we're gonna prove this by contrapositive. So suppose that f is not univalent, it means there are two distinct z1 and z2, such that um, uh, f takes the same value on both of them, let's call it w. f minus w has isolated zeros at these two points. Uh, and so let's put little disks around uh, each, each one of them. We can make these disks small enough uh, so that their closures do not touch, that their closures are disjoint. And uh, we can make them small enough such that f has uh, uh, has uh, 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 you know no zero um, uh, 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 out, uh, on on either of these uh, of these disks outside of z one and z two uh, either of these closed disks. It's it's not zero um, on uh, uh, you know anywhere on the closure of the disk except z1 and z2. Now, by Hurwitz, using, uh, uh, let's say for the first disk, using the, the little circle, uh, we have that, that f sub n um, 
minus w has the same number of zeros in the disk as f minus w, which is at least one, right? Uh, there's, 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 you know, f minus w is, is, is zero at uh, z1. And the same for the second disk. That means that um, uh, there exists a z1 prime uh, in the first disk and z2 prime in the second disk, uh, such that f f n minus w has has a zero there, um, and that means that f n z1 prime is equal to w and f n z2 prime is equal to w, and since these two disks are disjoint. Z1 uh, uh, prime and Z2 prime are not equal to each other, and therefore F sub n is uh, it's it's not univalent. It's it's not injective, right? So, so we've uh, we've proved the theorem.